They will be handing out after uh, after the service. Uh, if you want some, uh, help yourself. And if you want to donate to Cross Ties, or not Cross Ties, but to uh, Upper Room uh, Street Ministry, uh, please do so. It's a, it's a very good um, ministry that uh, Lon has got going on. How's everybody doing today? Okay, this side's doing good. How's this side doing over here? Well, I'm fixing to change that. <laughs> My message today is not, uh, not one of these jump, shout, swing from the chandelier type messages as I do every now and then, but it is very practical and may, uh, well, whatever it is, it is. You're going to get it, so it don't matter. I want to read one verse. Actually, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to speak on. I'm going to speak on pride. And if, you, if you've ever listened to me speak from time to time, sometimes I take a long way around to make my point. That's going to be one of those days. That's why I don't have it up there because I've got a lot of Scripture. But I think you'll get the point. First verse I want to read is uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. One verse. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for everything you've done here today, Lord. I thank you for each person that is here. Lord, I just ask that you open our ears, our eyes, our hearts to your word. Let the Holy Spirit just take over right now, Father. Reveal those things, those truths that you want us to see, Father. Give us a boldness to apply them to ourself and walk it out, Lord. That we can be shaped and molded into the image of your Son, Jesus. But Father, I thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do the rest of the day. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. That verse is very interesting. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And some people sit there and go, now, Richard, money's not evil. You know, money is not evil. Money by itself is not evil. There is nothing evil by itself. It's what you do with it. But it says, for the love of money. And here's the part that I really want to get to is the root of all evil. When you have a plant and you have a root, that's where it all begins. When you plant a seed, the first thing that pops out is actually a root. You can mow grass all day long. You can clip dandelions till your fingers fall off. Dandelions are going to continue to grow unless you get the root. There, thank you. See, now we're cooking. <clears throat> so if the love of money is the root of all evil, all, say all, all, all evil, yes, all evil. Man, you know, that's a big statement. That is a huge statement. The love of money is the root of all evil. But I want you to see where all that starts. And that's where I'm going to read my notes. It didn't start here on earth. It actually started in heaven. And I want you to see that. I want you to understand this clearly before we go on. Ezekiel chapter 28, we see a very interesting passage here about the king of Tyre. But it's not about the king of Tyre. It is about the power that is behind the king of Tyre. And you'll see this. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, 
Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealeth up the sum. That's all. When you say sum, that's added all together. That's how you get the sum. The sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Woo! That's a big statement from God. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Stop. The king of Tyrus was not in the garden of God. Who was in the garden of God? We know God was there. We know Adam was there. We know Eve was there. And Satan was there. And that's who we're talking about. Listen to this. Thou hast been in the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardas, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, gold, and the workmanship of thy tabrets and pipes, musical instruments inside of Lucifer. Tabrets and pipes was prepared in thee the day that thou was created. It was a created being. We are definitely talking about Satan. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou was on the holy mountain of God, and thou walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in all of thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. And we're going to see what that iniquity in Lucifer was. By the multitude of thy merchandise, uh, thou, thou was filled with violence. This is the first characteristics of the fallen nature of Satan, was violence. Look at the world today. Dear Jesus. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. All that stuff he was covered with, he was ripped from him. He was flat wealthy. Every precious stone was his covering. Thy heart was lifted up. You look up that word lifted up, it means to be haughty, prideful. Because of thy beauty. I want you to think about something. You look up that word beauty and it means to be bright, to be beautiful. Lucifer, now Satan, was covered with every, every precious stone. These, these were perfect stones. We're not talking about what we have today. We come up and they're flawed. and you know, it's, These were perfect stones, perfect in color, and they were, in, they were on Lucifer, and in heaven there was nothing but perfect light. Can you imagine what perfect light shining on all those perfect stones would have looked like? And it says that he was beautiful. And you look up that word beautiful, and it means to be bright and shiny. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, and I will lay you before kings, that they may behold you. You know, we are to behold Satan. We are to know him. We are to know his ways. We are to understand his purposes and know that his way is corrupt. All of his wisdom is corrupt. And he's been cast to the ground. It wasn't cast to hell. He was cast to the ground. And all those stones, all those precious stones were his. Everything, he was flat wealthy. And it says that his heart was lifted up in pride. Look at me, my, my, ain't I something? Just look how beautiful and shiny I am. I am the head of the choir, and I am fa fabulous. And God says, no, you're not. Watch this. Ripped all those stones away from him and cast him out of heaven, profane to the earth so that we can behold him. And he has given us power and authority over all of his power. So we see Lucifer, who was in heaven, head of the choir. This is one reason why music is such a powerful medium in this world today. Either in praise and worship 
or in secular music. Either way, it's powerful. It is meant to be powerful. And it is powerful. He was cast out of heaven because of pride. You can read the rest of this, I think. I'm not going to go into it. I don't think uh, there is some good stuff there. Another study for another day. Now I want to take you to another person in the Bible. First thing I want you to see is that pride, all, all evil, all sin, started with one individual, and it was because of pride, and it got him kicked out of heaven. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we have this cool dude by the name of Naaman. Starting in verse 1, chapter 5 of 2 Kings, it says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable because by him the Lord gave deliverance unto Syria, all of Israel. Syria came in, attacked Israel, and Israel fell to the Syrians, and Naaman was the captain of the army. He was an honorable man. The king respected him. The people, as he walked down the street, respected him. Kids, little kids, wanted to be like him. He is an honorable, he's the captain of the host of the army. He's the top dog. He's the head honcho. He's the big cheese. He's Ray. <laughs> okay, maybe not, but let's move on. <laughs> and when they'd gone out to Israel, they captured Israel, and within all their capturing, they took a maid that was and give uh, this little uh, Israelite girl, this maid, to his wife. But there's something about Naaman that he kept a secret. Naaman was a leper. Now, in those days, leprosy was a fatal disease. There was no cure for leprosy. In those days, if you were a leper... You were segregated from all the society because it was contagious. And here we have Naaman, the captain of the host of Syria, with all of his honor, with all of his pomp and fare, was a leper. And he kept that to himself. That was a little secret that he didn't want out. But within his own house, with his wife and with the little maid, they knew it. And the little maid said, you know, Naaman, if you would go to the prophet in Israel, you could be cured of that. So he went to the king and he asked, permission to go to Israel. King said, sure, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to write a letter to that king. Now understand, they did not, uh, they did not remove kings and stuff. Romans did. Syrians, Grecians, they allowed them to stay as they were. They took slaves, they took their spoils, but they allowed them governments to stay. When the Romans came in, they destroyed everything. Different people. So that king was still in power. So this king wrote a letter to that king. I'll read you what it says. And the letter to the king of Israel saying, Now, uh, when this letter has come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that they may recover him from leprosy. And the king became furious. That when the king read this, he rent his clothes and said, Am I God? Can I kill someone and bring him back to life? 
what's this king doing? Can you see he's trying to start a fight with me again because I can't heal this man? What's that king trying to do? I can't heal leprosy. And Elisha said, whoa, I got this. Send him to me. You send that man to my house. So Naaman gets the order to go to Elisha's house. Elisha turns around, or Naaman goes to Elisha's house, knocks on the door, and the servant comes to the door and says, what do you need? I'm sent here. I am Naaman, king or the captain of the host of Syria. He says, oh, yeah. He says, uh, Elisha said, go dip seven times in the Jordan. He said, what? Do you know who I am? He's not even going to come and talk to me. Elisha's in there in his recliner eating cheesecake, I'm sure. <laughs> Elisha didn't even have, didn't even honor him by going to the door and talk to him. He sent his servant. Now, keep this in mind. Here we have Naaman, king, I mean, captain of the host of Syria. All these men are in his charge. Thousands of men he's over. And now he's got a disease that is fatal. And he's told by a little maid, go to Israel, see the prophet. Well, how dare a little maid tell me what to do? But he does it. He goes to the prophet's house, and the prophet doesn't even have the nerve to go to the door and give him respect. He sends his servant. And now Naaman has to go to the nation of Israel, which he just conquered. These are people he just conquered, and now he's got to go to them. And Elisha don't even come to the door. And he says, don't, don't you people know who I am? He says, go, go down the Jordan, dip seven times, close the door, clunk. That was it. <laughs> and it says that Naaman, in rage, left the house. How dare, don't they know who I am? I could have legions of people come here and destroy this whole place. And his servant said, Gee, Naaman, you know, if he was to ask you to do a real hard thing like bring ten horses with gold and silver and uh, a whole store full of clothes and, and a cheesecake, bring all this stuff to me, you would do that. And he says, isn't there rivers we have we have these two rivers, and he names the two rivers in Syria. He says, I could go dip in them. But no, he wants me to go to this river in Israel, this filthy, dirty river in Israel, and dip seven times, not just get wet, not just kind of water, dip seven times in it. He said, well, if he asked you to do a hard thing, you'd do it. He's just asking you to go down the nasty old river and get muddy. Nathan goes down there. Naaman goes down there. Gets in this old, dirty, slimy river and dips once, comes back out, still has leprosy. Dips twice, comes back out, still has leprosy. I'm sure this is running through his head. I have been played as a fool. He goes down six times and comes back up and still has leprosy. The death sentence is still there. But he goes down the seventh time and he comes back up and he's healed and whole. Just like the prophet said. The part I want you to see in this whole story Naaman was a proud man. He had a proud position. 
people's arm, as important as it is, and I'm right-handed, as important as this arm is, if I got it cut off, I could live without my arm. But I can't live without my liver. Can't live without my lungs. Can't live without my heart, and those are the ones you don't see. We have a tendency to put a high premium on people we see. I'd done that before. A little testimony. I used to put a high premium on people. My spiritual father, I'll put it that way. He's the one that came to the jail and I started listening to and he got me going to church and spirit filled and here I am today because of him. And I understand God used him, but I put him on a high pedestal. And then that man changed somehow, divorced his wife, left his kids and started living a homosexual lifestyle and now still preaches that everyone's going to heaven, including Satan. I don't know what happened. But after that happened, I went to his house. He was, on, he was gone on a teaching thing, and I came back, and I came back to, and I came over to talk to him, and he was sitting there cussing up a storm. And that floored me. And then he starts teaching me all this. And he has a gift. He has a gift to bring this word of truth to light. He, can t he has that, that gift of teaching. And he took this word and he started twisting it and showing me every which way how everybody's saved. Everyone's going to heaven. It don't matter. You can do whatever you want to do. You're fine. And I was so puzzled. I, I, was, I was so confused at that time, I didn't know what to do. It messed with me bad. I, I threw my Bible down. I said, I don't, I don't know. I don't know anything. I'm, I'm done. I, I can't understand this. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit that brought me back on course, that revealed the truth of his word to me. And then I saw through the lies and the deception that he was living. But I put a high premium on a person. I'll never do that again. Don't, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people I love. There's a lot of people I listen to. But I will never, ever set a person up on a pedestal like I did that time because when he fell I was devastated I was literally devastated I wanted to quit the church I wanted to quit everything I didn't care but God is faithful who will lead us and guide us into all that truth and that's what I wanted and that's what I have prayed all my life is to know the truth of his word. And what I have found is that every single one of us in here, everyone without exception, either has, is, or will deal with pride. We can all get prideful. It's very easy to do. It's another trick of Satan. But pride is deadly. Pride is deadly. It can ruin a ministry. It can ruin a home. It can ruin a marriage. It can ruin a church. It will ruin your life. And God hates it. He doesn't hate you, but he hates pride. God kicked Lucifer out of heaven because of pride. And by Lucifer, every evil work came into being. Naaman was a prideful man. But it's interesting how the little, as it said, the little maid, didn't say just a regular maid, the little maid, that little 
voice, that little arm, as important as it is, and I'm right-handed, as important as this arm is, if I got it cut off, I could live without my arm. But I can't live without my liver. can't live without my lungs. can't live without my heart, and those are the ones you don't see. We have a tendency to put a high premium on people we see. I'd done that before. A little testimony. I used to put a high premium on people. My spiritual father, I put it that way. He's the one that came to the jail and I started listening to and he got me going to church and spirit filled and here I am today because of him. And I understand God used him, but I put him on a high pedestal. And then that man changed somehow, divorced his wife, left his kids and started living a homosexual lifestyle and now still preaches that everyone's going to heaven, including Satan. I don't know what happened. But after that happened, I went to his house. He was, on, he was gone on a teaching thing, and I came back, and I came back to, and I came over to talk to him, and he was sitting there cussing up a storm. And that floored me. And then he starts teaching me all this. And he has a gift. He has a gift to bring this word of truth to light. He, can t he has that, that gift of teaching. And he took this word and he started twisting it and showing me every which way how everybody's saved. Everyone's going to heaven. It don't matter. You can do whatever you want to do. You're fine. And I was so puzzled. I, I was it. <laughs> I was so confused at that time. I didn't know what to do. It messed with me bad. I I threw my Bible down. I said I don't I don't know I don't know anything. I'm I'm done. I I can't understand this. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit that brought me back on course that revealed the truth of his word to me and that I saw through the lies and the deception that he was living. But I put a high premium on a person. I'll never do that again. Don't, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people I love. There's a lot of people I listen to. But I will never, ever set a person up on a pedestal like I did that time because when he fell I was devastated I was literally devastated I wanted to quit the church I wanted to quit everything I didn't care but God is faithful who will lead us and guide us into all that truth and that's what I wanted and that's what I prayed all my life is to know the truth of his word. And what I have found is that every single one of us in here, everyone without exception, either has, is, or will deal with pride. We can all get prideful. It's very easy to do. It's another trick of Satan. But pride is deadly. Pride is deadly. It can ruin a ministry. It can ruin a home. It can ruin a marriage. It can ruin a church. It can ruin your life. And God hates it. He doesn't hate you, but he hates pride. God kicked Lucifer out of heaven because of pride. And by Lucifer, every evil work came into being. Naaman was a prideful man. But it's interesting how the little, as it said, the little maid, didn't say just a regular maid, the little maid, that little 
voice, that little, small, insignificant voice can give you the best direction that you'll ever need. I like to think of that little maid as the Holy Spirit. That when he conquered that land of Israel and brought that maid back, this was the whole plan of God. To put humility into a man that was full of pride. But that one little voice As we listen, we go out in this world and we listen to that little voice. It says, hey, watch out. It's kind of like the rooster crowing when Peter was denying Jesus. Peter denied Jesus at one time, the rooster crowed. Then it crowed again. That first time, it's like the Holy Spirit saying, Wake up, dude. Peter, pay attention. See what's going on. Look where you are. Look what you're doing. Listen to what you're saying. And he ignored it. It wasn't until after he denied him the third time, the rooster crowed again, and everything came back to him. That little small voice can save your marriage, can save your business, your ministry, maybe even your life. Like I said, this ain't going to be no jump and shout and hoop and holler message. But I think every single one of us need to be very much aware Oh, wow, look at these notes I forgot to get to. God gives us grace, he said, but he gives more grace to the humble. We of all people need to be humble, not prideful. And there's different types of pride. I'm proud of my brother for being in the military. I'm proud of all of our military. I'm proud of our country. But that's not pride. It's a, di it's a different... Even though it uses the same word, it's a different uh, emotion. But I get to speak behind the pulpit. You need to listen to me. <laughs> that's pride. That's arrogance. And that's foolishness. Because just like Jason's testimony was excellent, every single one of us in here had a sentence of death, just like leprosy. Every single one of us had a sentence of death. And somewhere in our life, some little small voice said, you need Jesus. Jesus, you mean i got to go to church? i got to go do this over there? Those Bible-thumping people, this bunch of hypocrites, i got to go, i got to. But when we humbled ourselves, we come to realize that we're in a mess and I'm on my way to hell, we came to Jesus. We accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We dipped seven times and came up clean. So I thank the Lord for Jesus Christ. Why don't you stand? There was absolutely nothing Naaman could do for himself. Even the king of Israel couldn't do it for him. But the man of God, the prophet of God, give him a word from God by which he could be healed. Every single one of us carry that word in us. And there's a lot of people that have a sentence of death out there that are sick, that are dying. Marriages are on the rocks. Businesses are failing. Ministries falling apart. Health, finances, 
Satan's touching everything in any way he can. And yet we have that word in us. We have that answer. I want you to take the hand of the person next to you. Father, I thank you and I praise you for this day. I thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for the name of Jesus that is above all names. That you care for us so much that you sent your son to die in our place. That that death sentence that we had hanging over us has been removed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, I lift up each person that's here today. That your word says that you would supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That there is nothing in Richard that can change anybody or anything. But the Holy Spirit that dwells within each one of us. The word of God that is in us can change everything. So, Father, today, as everyone stands here in unity right now, whatever our need is, Lord God, you know every need. You know everything about us. So, Father, I ask right now in Jesus' name that you meet those needs. Meet those needs, Lord. That they will prosper. That they will be in health, even as their soul prospers. That you are a God of restoration. You restore life to ministries, to marriage, to business. We sang that song this morning, Let It Rain. Father, I say, Let It Rain. Let your blessings shower down upon us tonight. Keep us ever mindful. Give us the ear to hear that little voice that can change the direction of our life. That when we get off course, we will hear that voice. Correct our steps. Let your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, Lord. May we forever worship you. May we forever give you praise. We we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. Be with us, Lord, as we go from this place. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. The ministry team will be over here. The prophetic team will be over here. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Gave life, hope and salvation.